Notice is hereby given of the regular meeting of the Board of Education of the Town of Westfield in the County of Union, New Jersey at 7.30 p.m. on the evening of January 22nd, 2013 in the boardroom of the Administration Building, 302 Elm Street, Westfield, New Jersey. The purpose of the meeting is to transact the regular business of the board and to transact any other business to properly come before the board. This is to advise the general public and to instruct that it be recorded in the minutes that in compliance with Chapter 231 of the Public Laws of 1975, entitled the Open Public Meetings Act, the Westfield School Board on Friday, January 18, 2013, caused to be posted at the Office of the Board of Education, located at 302 Elm Street, Westfield, New Jersey, and delivered to the Westfield Leader, the Star Ledger, the Westfield Library, Town Clerk of Westfield, the Alternative Press, and Patch.com, a meeting notice setting forth the time, date, and location of the meeting. Dana, can we do a roll call? Lucy Beagler? Here. Ann Carey? Here. Mark Friedman? Here. Brendan Galligan? Here. Roseanne Kerstad? Here. Jenny Lights? Here. Rich Matesic? Here. Gretchen Oleg? Here. Mitch Slater? Roseanne, could you lead us in the flag? Sure. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, announcements. Brendan, have you done yours? Yes, uh, from the Intermediate Schools. The Science Olympiad. Congratulations to the Edison Intermediate School Science Olympiad team who returned to Westfield with two awards at the regional competition held on January 8th. The students won second place in an experimental design and fourth place in Mousetrap out of 21 other middle schools that competed. Natalia Zeller McLean and Evan Binder won second place in experimental design where they were given objects and a task and had to create and write up an experiment. Sydney Gardner and Mark Fico won fourth place in mousetrap vehicles. They had to design a vehicle powered by a mousetrap. The 18 students who participate in the competition, all eighth graders at Edison Intermediate School, take Science Olympiad as an elective. Kudos to the students and their science teacher, Willa Schaefer. Thank you. I have a few community <coughs> announcements. Um, the first, the Women's Club of Westfield invites all aspiring student poets and authors from kindergarten through high school to enter its 2013 Youth Poetry and Short Story Contest. The deadline for submission is Wednesday, January 30th, and must be the original unpublished work of the author written during the contest year. For more information, please email wcw at westfieldnj.com. <coughs> Um, the, edu the Education Fund of Westfield is hosting Rock for Schools on Saturday, February 2nd from 6 to 9 at the Crossroads in Garwood. The evening will include music and refreshments, and proceeds will benefit the grant programs established for teachers to enhance classroom learning in the Westfield Public Schools. For more information, visit www.westfieldnj.com backslash efund. And finally, the 2012 Origami by Children exhibit is being displayed at the Westfield Memorial Library through the end of January. A traveling exhibit, this year it features two Westfield Public School students, Mark Gillespie, who is a high school junior, and Fiona Gillespie, a seventh grader at Edison. Thank you. <coughs> this is from the Intermediate Schools and the Robotics Team. The Westfield Robotics team hailing from Edison Intermediate School and led by Westfield Technology Education teacher Sean Bonacera won the PTC Design Award at the Piscataway First Tech Challenge qualifying competition on January 12th. The team won the same recognition on December 15th at the Tech Challenge qualifying competition at Livingston High School sponsored by FIRST which is an ac acronym for, for Inspiration and Recognition of Science and Technology. Westfield's team began as an after-school robotics club that this year includes six students who are, who are all current or former students at, at Edison Intermediate, including Neil Makia, Jordan Hindis, Vivek Skrinivasan, Jen Rogers, Spencer Fishman, and Mike Carides. The students received the award for functional and aesthetic design for their wirelessly remote-controlled robot that was built to collect and place more plastic rings on a rack than the opposing teams within a two minute time frame. Congratulations to these talented students and their advisor. And this is from the high school. 
Westfield High School students won top awards in the Model UN conference held January 4th through 6th in Hershey, Pennsylvania. It was attended by approximately 50 schools in New Jersey, Delaware, Pennsylvania, and Massachusetts. The Westfield High School delegation, comprised of 140 students, earned the Premier Delegation Award, the Outstanding Country Research Paper Award, the Premier Diplomat Awards, Youth Secretariat Award, and 10 Westfield High School students were elected to attend this summer's conference on national affairs. The club's advisors are Westfield High School teachers Daniel Farabau and David Della Ferra. The club is run in conjunction with the Westfield YMCA. For names of, the, of all of the students, 140 40 of them, receiving awards, please check the homepage of the district website. Congratulations. This is a flu reminder. As has been sadly evident during the last several days, the flu season is upon us. Every year at this time, people of all ages are exposed to this virus. In an attempt to limit the number of cases, we join our school nursing staff in reminding families to take some important steps to limit the spread of this virus. According to the CDC, prevention and treatment <coughs> include vaccination, attempt to stay away from people who are sick, wash hands frequently with soap and water. If soap and water is not available, use alcohol-based hand rub and consult with your physician regarding the recommended medications. If you have an elevation in your temperature, stay home and only leave your house to get medical care. Before returning to work or school, your fever should be gone for 24 hours without fever, reducing medication. This is from the Westfield Concert Choir. Westfield High School Concert Choir would like to thank the community for its support and participation in two recent fundraisers, a total of $1,750, which will go towards scholarship, scholarships and future choir department trips, was raised through the Christmas Tree Disposal Program. In addition, at its holiday concert, the choir department held a collection to benefit a Jersey Shore Christmas an organization that helps families who have been devastated by Hurricane Sandy. Thanks to the support and generosity of the concert audience, $924 was received and converted into gift cards. And one more announcement from regarding the Westfield High School Sandy concert. This Friday, January 25th, from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m., Westfield High School will be hosting a benefit concert featuring four bands. All proceeds will go to the Westfield High School Helping Hands Fund and Hurricane Sandy relief efforts at the Jersey Shore. For more information, please visit whsbenefit.weebly.com. -E -E and from the intermediate schools regarding Geography Bs, congratulations to this year's Geography B first place winners, sixth grader Colby Chen from Edison Intermediate School and sixth grader Jasper Lemberg from Roosevelt Intermediate School. Congratulations. Um, and I have an announcement on Monday. I was pleased to attend the townwide commemoration of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Our school district was well represented there with board member Ginny Lights in attendance, as long, uh, along with 10 administrators and many of our teachers. We had many students from the elementary, intermediate, and high school in attendance with their families as well. Along with other representatives of the community, I spoke on the event's focus on the power of unity. And in my speech, I spoke of the power of unity that we had evidenced in Westfield in the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy, in the aftermath of Newtown, and right now as our students, staff, and the medical community and the parents of Westfield High School are working together as we deal with the sudden death of one of our students. This year in the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. commemoration, we had an overwhelming participation by students in the competitions that were presented by Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, committee. And I'd like to thank all of the students who participated and would like to announce the first place award winners in each of the categories. So in the intermediate schools for essays, Sarah Israel, uh, an eighth grade student at Edison, won first place for poetry. Emily Holtzman, another eighth grade student at Edison, won first place. And at the elementary level, for essays, it was Ashley Klein, a Jefferson student. For poetry, Jack Sumas, a Franklin student. And for art, 
Isabel Gauthier, uh, Tamaqua students. And congratulations to all of the students who took the time to interpret the meaning of Dr. King's powerful messages and participated. Thank you. The next meeting of the Board of Education will be held on Tuesday, February 19th at 7.30 p.m. We will continue our discussion of the 2013-2014 school budget, and we will also be honoring the vocal and instrumental music students who have received state and regional awards. And with that, I'd like to turn to our final announcement. Yes, yeah, so last, uh, I think it was last spring actually, when we were doing these announcements at the beginning of the uh, meeting, we had an announcement about a program at Roosevelt uh, Intermediate School and talked about how well it was going. But since then, another chapter has been written. Um, so uh, in order to explain it just a little bit more, we've actually invited um, the teacher who's involved in it, um, Mr. Califat, um, to present tonight. And I think he has some people who are helping. And we also have Mr. Nelson, who was the uh, administrator in charge when the program began last year. So I believe I'm introducing Ms. Mr. Califat to explain the program. Hmm. Hey, good evening, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen of the board, the district, and the public, and thank you for this opportunity. As she said, my name is Matthew Califat, and I'm an eighth grade language arts teacher at Roosevelt Intermediate School. Tonight, we are very excited to announce the publication this month of a brand new ebook edition of the classic John Steinbeck novel of Mice and Men. Now, why are we announcing this ebook at a meeting of the Westfield Board of Education? It's because in this new ebook appear six Westfield students and two staff members, myself and Mr. Derek Nelson, in a dozen different videos discussing the themes, characters, and historical context of the novel. Our interviews appear in a section entitled, quote, How Do You Steinbeck in the Classroom? at the back of the ebook, right after an interview with Academy Award winner James Earl Jones, who narrates this ebook edition. Each video is between two and three minutes, and we were filmed last June at Penguin's corporate offices in New York City. This is exciting news on many, many fronts. Not to overstate the obvious, but let's think about what this really means. From now on, whenever any person or any school district buys this ebook, they will get us. <laughs> <laughs> Said another way, all of you, Greta and Rebecca, Maya and Owen, Max and Evan, and the Westfield School District name now live in digital eternity. <laughs> Classic film bus will get the reference. <laughs> These six students are now freshmen at Westfield High School. I was very, very fortunate, and I mean that sincerely, to have had them as eighth graders last year at Roosevelt. I want to take this moment to publicly tell you how impressed everyone is who has seen you in these videos. You're all extremely talented and thoughtful young people, and I mean that from the heart. I also want to publicly commend your parents, many of whom are here tonight in the audience. Whatever you are doing at home is clearly working. Each of these students is a worthy ambassador of this district, this town, and young people in general. Now, the next logical question is, why would Penguin select Westfield out of the literally thousands of school districts around the world who read this book every year? Why do they pick us? And to answer that is my colleague, Mr. Derek Nelson. Good evening, everyone. Um, Matt put out the question, why did they pick Westfield? Well, to answer that question, we really have to go back a little bit further to basically when I was first hired here in Westfield. As some of the board members know and some of the students know and some of Mr. Carey over there knows, um, I spent my first, I guess, eight, nine years in education, in urban education. I grew up four miles away from here in Plainfield. Um, I taught in the Plainfield school system, and I was an administrator in Orange. And then I came here to start at Roosevelt for two years under the tutelage of Stuart T. Carey. <laughs> and one of the biggest things that I noticed in coming to Westfield was how similar the kids are. Kids in urban education, kids in suburban education, they have a lot of the same wishes, same dreams, same hopes, same goals. And 
I coupled that with the fact that I grew up four miles away from here. And through my experiences as a kid and my experiences as a teacher, I never interacted with anybody from Westfield. And I realized after speaking with some of my students at Roosevelt that they never interacted with kids that were four miles away. But they might as well have been 4,000 miles away. Matt tried to steal my line, but I was going to use it tonight. <laughs> and I thought, what would be a good way to get these kids together? So I saw happen to be walking around the building one day, and I walked into Matt's classroom. And little did I know that Matt taught in Plainfield. As a matter of fact, we taught in Plainfield at the same time. And some of my students, I taught fourth and fifth grade most of my years, were filtered into his middle school. So when I looked up and I saw the kids that I had taught on his wall, I said, wait a minute, how do you know Naomi? You know, and, and that started sparked that conversation. And that was, then they were looking at Of Mice and Men. And I said, you know, Matt, I have this idea. Uh, it's kind of crazy, but I don't know how it's going to work. But I have this idea that what if we could get a group of kids from Plainfield and a group of our kids here at Roosevelt together to talk about the American dream, which is an overarching theme of the book of Mice and Men. And Matt was like, Derek, that's a great idea. And so being that I knew some people in Plainfield, I knew a lot of the administrators because we were teachers together, that sparked this whole process. I reached out to a friend of mine who was the principal of Cedarbrook School, and he thought it was a great idea. And we got two, two teachers together, and the rest is pretty much history. The program was started in, I think we did a year of planning almost, started almost spring, of, spring 11. of 11. Yep, spring of 11. And we planned for almost a year before we really got it up and running. And as we got it going, I said, you know what, this is something that really needs to be seen by not just people in Westfield, but abroad as well. So I wrote press releases and I sent it out to the Star Ledger and to the Post. And I sent one to the New York Times, which I was like, oh, we'll see what happens. But the New York Times actually wrote about it. And they had to send a reporter out to come interview not only the, the people and students here at um, in Roseville and Westfield, but also the students in Plainfield as well. And because of that article, Penguin saw that, and that's where they got the idea, said, hey, this sounds like a great program. Let's reach out to them and see if we can get them on the ebook. And that's really where this all kind of came about. So, um, I am extremely, I was extremely moved when I actually watched the kids sit and, and sat and interacted with each other and they talked about music, they talked about life, they talked about everything under the sun, you know, and then I was also blessed enough to go this year to see the second iteration of the program and to see how the kids were really opening up with each other and they were on stage talking and they were, it, was, it was a great, great program, you know, and I, I just felt just blessed to be a part of it, you know, really blessed to be a part of it. So. I guess without any further ado, that's really where it all came about. So <coughs> we're going to go to a PowerPoint here that we have with a couple of pictures of the program here. So I'll let say a picture is worth a thousand words, so it's about 10,000 words. in December of 2011. And the first batch of pictures are just the kids mixing together. <clears throat> and this is the first time a lot of these kids had seen or interacted with people who, quite frankly, were of a different color, different socioeconomic background. And Derek and I aren't going to lie, it was, it was a little awkward at first, it was. But youth takes over. And the kids became kids, as these pictures show. They ate lunch together, they attended their classes. We discussed the American dream before we had lunch, that all my eighth grade students, their eighth grade students met in the cafeteria beforehand. This is a joint Plainfield-Westfield uh, wiki that we're using again this year that Ms. Pamela Friedman, the technology teacher at Roosevelt, created in which we go online and discuss open-ended analytical questions. Kids from Plainfield, kids from Westfield would post questions. Um, you can access this wiki to look at it if you want. Um, like Derek said, the New York Times came and they put this in the front section. 
This is the headline, Split by Race and Wealth, but Discovering Similarities as a Study Steinbeck, by Winnie Hugh, published January 16, 2012. No exaggeration. I think, Derek, you got emails too, but I got emails from educators across the country. Got about a half dozen, Long Island, Kansas, Cal. Wow, what a great program. How do you go about doing this? That's the power of, of the press. So Penguin saw it, like Derek said. They, they sent an email to Derek and myself. They said, pick your, pick your best and your brightest, and we did. And in June 2012, six RIS eighth graders traveled to New York City in my minivan. <laughs> it was one of the Penguin's corporate offices. It was just one of those magical days the kids still talk about it today. I mean, we felt like big shots, and, and we, we were. <laughs> there they are, uh, walking. They're like, Mr. Calif, I stopped taking pictures. You're not our father. <laughs> but they, they could not be denied. Right. Here's uh, Greta being filmed. It's a professional film crew that Penguin hires to produce their stuff. There we are outside their offices. They can sell free books. And while this is cool, don't get me wrong, the ebook is wonderful. I think the, the, the heart of the story, to me, is the interaction of the kids. So, and with a couple pictures of the kids just, just being goofy together. Hmm. I love this stuff. They're just hanging out, you know, hanging out with each other. That is the PowerPoint. Now, um, I wanted to show you just a, a couple clips of the actual ebook. We have the iPad here. Uh, Penguin has donated uh, 10 free ebooks. We'll use, maybe we'll split them between the middle schools. I'm not sure how we'll do that. But they donated, cost $11.99. You can get them on iTunes. Might have you purchased it on iTunes already, right? It's $11.99 on iTunes. Um, I'm just going to plug this in and we'll show you a couple clips. There's the official uh, ebook. Lori, do you have a sound? Lori. Sound. Maybe not. <laughs> hey, we'll just look at it. <laughs> so this is the back of the ebook, and what you see is, you know, touch screen activated just there's a, like a dozen different three-minute video vignettes of the kids discussing the various themes. And we were, like I said, filmed in uh, June. Penguin sent Derek and I a rough cut in the fall. We looked it over probably about a thousand times. And then it was released. The official release date was just a few weeks ago, January 3rd. And there's already been some online publicity about it in the trade education uh, blogs, trade publication, uh, e-journals. And it's getting really good reviews. So. Steinbeck in the schools, kids, who wants to be embarrassed first? <laughs> All right, I'll, do, uh, I'll, play, I'll, I'll try and play one of these. And we have sound from your iPad. <laughs> you want this yeah. mic? It might just play. seems to make a lot of people happy, but I don't think it's true happiness. I think that happiness overall is the American dream, but I think that on the surface what we really have is 
the white picket fence and the stereotype of having property, but I think that behind that is really the independence and the happiness. And I think most people want to be successful, but that's more associated with money. But I think that the real true success in life is when you're happy and you have your family and your friends are all there for you. Well, George and Lenny's American Dream is get their own piece of land, have animals on the land. I think even though their dream is to own land and to be able to like live in their own little house and they can go out whenever they want, their real dream is just to be independent, to be able to go wherever, do whatever, have no one above them. And I think for a lot of people, the American dream is the exact same thing. Even though we have our specifics, like you may want a certain job or to live in a certain place, everyone just wants independence and know they can stand up on their own without someone else. So that's a sample of uh, one of the dozen videos. And again, very impressive work for 13 and 14 year olds to think on that level and articulate themselves. Another video or if we're good? <laughs> All right, we will introduce the kids now. They are here on a school night. <laughs> uh, first is Mr. Uh, Max Carl. They're just going to say a few words about their experiences. All right, uh, thank you, Mr. Califat. And all I just really want to say is this has been a really great experience, and I've been very happy to be a part of it. And even though we were like the guinea pigs of all of this, <laughs> I, I did think this was a lot of fun and I'm glad the program is still going strong. And I just want to say thank you to Mr. Califat, Mr. Nelson for establishing this program because it really was a lot of fun. I learned a lot and if any of you are looking at me thinking that's the guy with the messed up hair, it's okay. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, well, I thought that it was a fun experience Oh, I'm Evan, and I thought this was a uh, fun experience, and it was both experiences meeting the Plainfield kids and going to film in New York City were both fun experiences, and I would definitely do it again with another time if we could do that. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> but um, it was a lot of fun, and I thought it was a great idea, and I want to thank Mr. Nelson and Mr. Kyle Fat, and yeah. Hi, I'm Rebecca. Um, I wanted to say that the trip to New York was a really, really different experience because um, when we were there being interviewed, it was a lot different than the classroom experience because um, we had to kind of keep our focus so that we wouldn't lose track of what we were saying because we were the only ones talking and they're just asking us the questions. But it was really, really interesting and you could tell that the people were interested in the things that we had to say. So that was really fun to do. And I'm thank you for and picking me to do this. Hi, I'm Greta. Um, I just want to thank you, Kilf and Mr. Perry, for um, taking me to do this. I learned so much last year. I think I'd have to say more than I did in all of like schooling combined I just think um, I learned so many life lessons and everything on these two days or three days right? yeah three days um, with the Plainfield Westfield exchange and Penguin I learned so much about how sheltered we are in Westfield and how as Mr. Nelson said we never go outside of our town but when we did and we met these kids from Plainfield we realized how similar we were to them and it was a great experience, so thank you. I'm Maya. Um, I just wanted to say how cool I think it is to be part of this ebook. I mean, it's a classic piece of American literature, so at first when I was like chosen to be in the ebook, I was like, cool, it's an ebook. I didn't realize how big of a deal it was. I was talking to my uncle a couple of days ago, and I told him I was in this ebook. He's like, "There's no way you're in an ebook for a classic piece of American literature." I'm like, yeah, I am. So I thought it was so cool. Also, being in the classroom with Mr. Calfat, we were so free to explore any ideas we wanted. We all bounced things back and forth. So the fact that a lot of America is able to hear what we have to say and listen to what everything that we've come up with in class, bounce back and forth with Plainfield, is just so cool. And I really want to thank everyone who made it possible. Derek, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't actually do a sincere thanks to uh, Mr. Carey. I mean, you and I both worked, you know, in corporate world, 
in our other school districts, and it, not everyone says yes, but he didn't hesitate. So I'd like to say a special shout out to Mr. Carrier for saying yes and supporting it wholeheartedly. So thank you. Uh, in closing, you know, in this profession, we'd like to say the ultimate goal is educating the quote unquote whole child. Yet there are debates about how to do that and even what the term fully means. You know, there's little debate that in this district we know how to educate, you know, certainly in the classroom. But what about the rest, the whole child? It sounds fairly ambitious. Well, this is how I see it. As millennial America you know, grows increasingly diverse, it seems obvious that the young people who will be most productive in and most prepared for the real world will be those who know how to connect with people who may be different than they are. Given that line of thinking, I believe this program is going a long way towards reaching that elusive whole child. And if you want to see the exchange program in action, I didn't ask permission, Mr. Carey, but I'm going to say it out there. I invite all of you. <laughs> the board, the public. I invite all of you to Roosevelt on Friday, February 1st. Coming up. That day, 68th grader from Plainfield will spend the day at Roosevelt. Yes, they'll be completing the official sounding year two of the Plainfield-Westfield Exchange Program. But more importantly, much more importantly, they'll be doing what kids everywhere do. Learning, having fun, together. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd ask the board if, if there are comments or questions, but first just want to note um, how, how proud we feel, um, and we thank you for that, for, for the way you've represented the district um, and the maturity with which you've done so, not only um, in, in your partnering with, with students from another town, um, but you're representing uh, the district uh, at the corporate offices of Penguin and, and now on the e-book. Um, and just with such a, a well-rounded, uh, mature, mature display, it's, it's phenomenal. And I have no doubt that your parents are very proud of you, uh, which is, is even more important. I do want to just, uh, I'll give this to, to your teacher, just a certificate from the Board of Education uh, for each of you, uh, congratulating you for your participation in the e-book of Mice and Men. We, we truly do thank you. It's a wonderful thing. I think I would just like to add briefly, I've, I've been able to view, I think, all of the videos. Um, it really is worth a download. Um, the students are amazing. They're insight uh, into a book that probably just about all of us have read. Um, some of it will remind you of what you thought when you read it, and some of it will challenge you to think a little differently. And I also will say, um, I was also so proud of both Mr. Califat and Mr. Nelson, and in uh, what they expressed in their parts of the ebook. Um, there's a lot of wisdom there and I think we can be very proud of our staff members so, so thank all of you thank you very much You guys are welcome to stay. By all means, you don't have to stay. Or to get ready for ninth grade. I'm sorry. I'd just like to mention before people leave that Owen Murray was also part of the um, group of students who are in the ebook, but he is home with the flu. So um, we'd just like to thank him for his participation and congratulate him as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. There's a message there, Rosie. <laughs> <laughs> At least it's not in front of you. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you.
really get that far. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that was After the meeting. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right. With that, I would like to recognize the public for agenda items only. Seeing no one come to the podium, I'd ask that we move to the superintendent's report. Dr. Dolan. Yes, so we have two superintendent reports this evening. Um, the first one um, has to do with the technology initiative that uh, we've uh, implemented this year. Um, we certainly have talked about it quite a few times at this table. We, last year we talked about planning for it and what we would be able to do. Uh, we uh, did a lot of work last year, a lot of work over the summer, have started the technology initiative. And one part of that technology initiative is the um, um, support for our teachers in the form of master technology teachers. We have two master technology teachers, one for our elementary schools and the other for our intermediate and high schools. And um, it's my privilege to introduce both of them right now. And they're going to tell us a little bit about uh, what they've been up to uh, since September. So I'd like, it's my pleasure to introduce Janine Gottko, who is our elementary master technology teacher, and Nancy Latimer, who is our intermediate and high school uh, master technology teacher. Hi everyone, it's great to be back. We're very excited to be here to update you on what we've been up to since September. Um, what we thought we would do is to show you our websites as just a talking point so you could kind of get a feel for what we have been doing. Uh, the first thing that we needed to do, obviously, was to um, lay the groundwork. So how would the teachers know who we are, what we have to offer, how would we fulfill the needs of the teachers, how do we even know what those needs are, and so forth. So the first thing um, up there on the screen, you see my, my website, and we'll show Janine's in a little bit. Um, that website is accessible from the high school main website, also from the Edison main website, and from the technology uh, instruction page from Roosevelt's site. It's also accessible from a, a di the district website. So there's multiple ways to get to it. Um, what basically happens here is this is a point of contact for the teachers if they would like to basically ask for help if they would like to ask a quick question perhaps they want information on a one-to-one -one basis so I have a form there on the right that basically says if you could fill out the form tell me when you're available and then we could set up a meeting time for a one-on-one -on -one time how do they even know who we are well in the beginning what we did was we went around to uh, faculty meetings we introduced ourselves we spent time with the, the principals we spent time with vice principals we go to department meetings, anything where we could sort of get our, a foothold in, send out uh, emails. Janine sends a lot of emails as well. So anywhere we, we can kind of uh, put ourselves out there so people would know who we were and, and why we are here and how we can help them. Okay. We also initially created a survey and the survey asked a lot of questions about different types of technologies. So it might ask, uh, what types of technologies are you interested in learning about? It asked, how proficient do you feel you are with technology? What type of learning is best for you? Do you prefer one-on-one, -on -one, small group instruction, professional development, and so forth? Okay. So when they go to my website up here on the main page, what I have is a variety of information. In addition to being able to schedule the one-on-one -on -one time, I have information about professional development. What I do for that is I do uh, t what I call tech talks. That's a 40 minute talk on a particular technology based upon the survey results. I do this during either lunch periods or during the morning periods depending upon the school. And so I repeat it multiple periods and the teachers can kind of drop in if it's a lunch time. They can bring their lunch, they can sit. I talk about a technology, they get some professional development time. In addition to that, I do uh, professional development courses that are available to everyone after school. I find this works really well because some teachers say, well, you know, I really can't come after school. And other teachers say, well, you know, it really works best for me at lunchtime. And it's really a mix. So it's, it's constantly evolving to try to serve the needs of the teachers at the various schools. OK, so I'm going to come back to give you some examples of what I've been doing in a little bit. Um, Dana, would you mind just clicking on that iPads tab there? Obviously, iPads have been huge particularly with the lower grades this year because in many cases the iPads are the only technology that they're really using. So on this page we have the procedures and Janine has something similar that we developed for if a teacher is requesting an app to be installed on the carts. So the multiple carts of iPads, they go through a procedure that basically sends the request first to Janine or myself. We kind of review it from a technical standpoint and then we send it on to the supervisor and the principal of the building. They ultimately make the decision whether or not the app gets installed. 
At that point, we go back to the ITS for the building. So we work very closely with the ITS to try to help support them with what they're doing in their individual buildings. So most people probably don't use the term ITS. <laughs> it's instructional Technology Specialist. Okay, somebody mentioned Pam Friedman before, so there's a, there's a person doing that in every building except for the high school. So we work very closely with them to try to support them. And, you know, the advantage that we have over the Instructional Technology Specialist is that we have flexibility. They're, they're teachers, so they can only help people when they have free time, whereas Jeannie and myself can help people whenever it's convenient for them. So if they fill out a form and they say to me, you know, I'm, f I'm free fourth period on Thursdays and Fridays, I can set up that time and come over when it's convenient for them to their building and meet them wherever it, it, it works for them. So in addition on that page, I have a listing for the carts of what apps are installed on the carts in the different buildings. So if a teacher wants to know, well, what, what can I use the iPads for? What can I do with them? They can get an idea. There's a description of each app, what it can do. And they can take a look at that, and we keep that up to date. Okay? So what I'd like to just do briefly is just kind of give you, since I'm very subject-oriented versus K through f 5, I'm dealing with, you know, the science teachers want science apps and the math teachers want math apps. I thought I'd go down the various subjects and just give you an idea of some things that I've done with the different subject content area teachers. So for English, we have a journalism class right now, and they're basically, they're using something called Edmodo. Edmodo is like a, f a safe Facebook for, for K through 12. They use that to have classroom conversations outside of school. So that's a journalism class. So the teacher might ask a question, like in the beginning of the year, she asked them, what do you think journalism really is about? And they all responded, and they could see each other's responses. Fine arts. We have some great, so many great apps for the arts. Um, there's a free one called Art Circles, which it, it basically organizes by different content areas, by curators and things like that. We've talked to the art teachers about the best ways to display art with their own iPads if they bought an app and they wanted to show art. So HGTVs, for example, being maybe a better mechanism for that than, let's say, a projector. Uh, health and physical education. This has been a little bit of a surprise to me. They've been really interested in using the iPads. So at Edison, we did something really fun. The kids all did Zumba routines, and we had them videotaped. My favorite was a group of boys who were very serious doing their Zumba routine because they were being videotaped. And we, we basically, I taught the teachers how to create a safe YouTube online account, sent a letter home to the parents. The videos were all set to private, but then the teachers had a way to get the video off the iPad because that's always a challenge because we're sharing the iPads. And they were very excited. The kids love that. Math has been a big user of the iPads. We can use uh, an app called Nearpod, for example, to do presentations. You could put up some, a graph paper picture the kids write on the iPad, and then the teacher can share the results of, let's say they were doing a problem on graph paper, they can share the results of that with the rest of the class. So the whole class participates. Science, we have some really great apps for the periodic table of the elements, for uh, one called Solar Walk that the teachers are using with their classes. Social studies has been a really big user of the iPads. We use a, an app called Socrative. It's very popular. It's, I don't know if you're familiar with clicker systems, but basically you get the class to participate by asking questions, by doing polls and things like that, and then the teacher can show the result of the poll, and it's all anonymous, which is really nice. So you could say that 50% of you answered this way. Um, world language, again, they create little videos. Maybe they pick out some pictures of monuments in France, and then they speak in the language about those monuments and create a little video. And special education, of course, the accessibility features of an iPad are fantastic. Uh, you know, you have uh, the ability to speak all the uh, words in a book out loud. You can make the icons larger and things like that. And a lot of teachers are not aware of those features of iPads, so we've worked on that as well. So I'm talking really fast because Janine needs to go. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. Sure. Um, I too as well wanted to show you my, um, I have a blog as opposed to a website. So mine is a little more updated on a daily basis. Um, it is my main communication tool between me and the elementary schools. Um, I have seven elementary schools that I'm working with, so I found this is the best way to get information out. There's a bunch of things that go on there, but mainly what happens is I've tried to put into some categories. Because the iPads are brand new to the elementary schools, um, a lot of teachers do not have experience with a lot of educational apps, so part of my job and the great thing about it is I have time to research apps and find apps that are good and find free apps, which are always a benefit 
um, when we have money constraints. So every day almost when I find a good app that I feel is really good for the district or for a teacher to use, I will put it up there on the blog and it will be updated um, for the teachers to check out and kind of see if they want to use it with the whole cart. It's more for the teachers to see is it, you know, good for their classroom, does it fit with what they're doing and you know, would this be something we would want to put on the cart. Um, I also like to include examples of different blogs that are out there for teachers to use for professional development and also for ideas for things they might have in their classrooms. Um, there are also examples of things we're doing in the district. So, Dan, if you don't mind scrolling down just a little bit more, you might have to go past some of the fun free apps. Um, there's an example, I think it's one more down there, um, where I sat in with a speech um, teacher over at Wilson, Mrs. Waters, and she was doing, it's one more, I think, she was doing a lesson with her students, one more, sorry, going down, <laughs> one more. <laughs> See, it's the updated daily with a blog. Um, this is it right here. Um, I call it Terrific Teacher Thursday. Um, I sat in with her and her students, and she was using the iPad with an app called Social Skills Express, and they were children who had um, social skills issues and this was one about making eye contact so I was able to sit in with her because she wanted my advice on how she taught the lesson did she think she was using the iPad effectively I kind of monitored the lesson and gave her some feedback afterwards but then was able to share with the rest of my subscribers and the people who go to my blog what was out there and you know how did she use it what were some of the great things about it because maybe there's a speech teacher in another school that might not have known about it so I'll put it up on the blog and do things like that um, also um, Dan if you wouldn't mind scrolling all the way up to the top there is um, embedded in the whole entire website there are resources for the teachers to go to so there's iPad resources similar to Nancy's website where it has a list of the iPad apps that are on the elementary cards throughout each school um, we have tech teachnology classes that I teach after school kind of like a professional development so on Tuesdays, um, we have a schedule of them through the professional development department. I've also made all the resources for that class available on the website. They're called Live Binders. And um, the teachers can go into those Live Binders and get all the resources that they would normally get with the professional development class so that if they were not able to attend the classes, they could still be learning on their own. And a lot of teachers have said this is really great because of their schedules and all the things that are going on to do that. Um, we have been in the schools, obviously, not only just as professional development people, but like I said, teaching with the teachers. So a lot of that I have done um, with especially iPads, because like I did mention, they are new to the district, especially at the elementary level. Unless teachers have had their own iPads, we've never had a cart like this with 30 iPads. And some teachers have found that overwhelming and not quite sure how do you make that work in a class of 22 first graders, which can be very overwhelming if you think about it. So one of the things I've been doing for the past four months is going in to most of the first and second grades, depending on the building, um, and even the third, fourth, and fifth grade in other buildings if they're just starting out, and kind of going over iPad orientation. How do we use an iPad in school? You know, showing them how we navigate through the iPad apps, how they take care of the volume, turn it on and off, simple things like that. And then we've kind of built on that. So I'm now into the process of going into secondary lessons in some classrooms where we're actually using certain apps and we've worked it into their lessons. Um, just like Nancy did, I just want to highlight a few things at each grade level because like she said, she's more subject specific. Um, first grade, what we've been using is there's an app called EduCreations and it is available online as well. And what it is is a whiteboarding app. And the students have been, just for an example, one of the education lessons we're doing is they've been working with different types of sentences as they do in first grade. So they've been typing their sentences into the whiteboarding app and then they create little slides almost like a PowerPoint. But it's very simple. They draw illustrations to go with it. And then at the end, what you can do with educations is you can record them reading their sentences. And they make almost like a little mini movie of them reading their sentences. So when they're doing the different types of sentences, it's great because then they can read, you know, declarative and derogative sentences in the different tones that they're supposed to. And then they can hear it back. And it's they they love it. They think it's the coolest thing. <laughs> um, second grade, we've been doing a lot with the math apps. We do um, have five of our everyday math apps that go with our math program on the iPad, so we've worked with them with reinforcing their math skills. Um, I have not done as much, it's more the teachers kind of taking it as the end of their math lesson. They've kind of gone in, taken five of the iPads out and used them as centers. Um, third grade and fourth grade, we've been using an app called Toontastic, which is a lot of fun. <laughs> if you haven't found Toontastic and you have an iPad, it's great. It is a cartooning app. But what it really does is it follows the story arc and kids, especially with the reading and writing workshop, have been learning you know, different parts of the story and they can retell the stories they're reading and reading and writing workshop or they can plan out stories that they're going to write. And it's fun, it's interactive, they narrate and animate their characters 
and they love it. I mean, they're, they're just so engaged with it. And in fifth grade, we've been using Evernote, which some of you may be familiar with for your own professional purposes. Um, one of the fifth grade teachers was actually the one who shared it with us and thought it was a great way to have them publish their writings in the writing workshop. We've been having issues with the laptops and you know they're a little bit older, they don't work as well, the children get frustrated. Well, Evernote, um, obviously you can use it on a computer, but you, there's an app for the iPad. There's an app for your phone, there's an app for everything. So they've been creating class accounts, especially at the fourth and fifth grade level, and the students have been typing on their iPads. I just did a lesson over at fifth grade at Franklin School today, and the teacher said, I have never seen you so engaged and working so hard in writing workshop as they were doing it there. And it updates, um, basically what happens is they have different, each one of them, you can see everyone's account, so you can see all their, because they're all under one account. But they can go in and they can peer edit together, and they can give suggestions, and the teacher can also follow what they're typing. And she has been going in, one of the other teachers, and you know, while they're typing, giving them suggestions right there, immediate feedback. So they've been loving that. Um, and then the last thing we're doing is, she mentioned Edmodo, she's using it with the, the students. It's not really as appropriate for younger students right now, but we're using it as a professional development tool. And one of the things we've developed this last four months is we have an Edmodo group for each group, for each grade level to share their resources with the new reading and writing program. So we have about 60 to 70 members throughout the district who are, you know, it's in the infant stages, so we're trying to really work on putting it out there and getting it out there, but they're sharing resources across the district. So if a teacher's got a great idea in Jefferson third grade, they post it to the Emoto site and a teacher at Franklin can, you know, take that resource and use it in their classroom. And it's really something the teachers have wanted for a while now. So it's a great tool and we've been using it. Um, there's been a lot going on. <laughs> Our heads are spinning basically, but it's been wonderful because like Nancy said, having this opportunity, we have the time now, not just for the scheduling, but for the research to go behind it and to get out to them the best practices. And the teachers have said that's been the most wonderful thing is that now they feel more confident. You know, people have confidence levels, so they just need little tips. And someone who hasn't even used technology before, I've been in three or four, where they've never even touched an iPad before. And they're now in their second or third iPad lessons. And they said it was just because you were able to come in and co-teach with me. And I could see how you did it. And you gave me those tips. And now I feel so much more comfortable using them with my children. So it's been really great. It's been wonderful. And we're very happy. Yes. Yeah. I'm busy. I'm busy. <laughs> and we could talk for, you know, 20 yeah. more minutes. Well, but we know we should. <laughs> Appreciate that. Thank you. Any questions or comments? I had, I had just a couple questions. The, um, just about two years ago, we, we really enhanced our commitment to technology as a district. And I'd just be interested in your view. I think, one, um, how far along would you say we are to becoming uh, really a technology efficient district meaning we we've really embraced technology we're using technology efficiently throughout the district and that could be 10 percent 50 percent I, I don't know I mean, I'm, that's my question just your your gut feel and then secondly you know, how do we know we're continuing in the right direction so we're, we're buying a lot of iPads we're, we're wireless etc how, how do we how are we sure we you know we should continue to do that each each budget cycle and particularly with this budget discussion coming up we're going to talk about whether we should include additional amounts and how they should be used so just would be interested in your thoughts on that um, well I would say one thing that I've seen I think using iPads at the at the uh, high school level is more challenging we've discussed this um, because what happens is similar with um, the ebook that they created uh, the teachers want the students to create content and it's very difficult to create content on an iPad that's being shared around a building. Uh, it's challenging because they're really a one-to-one -one device. So we've had to be very creative in ways of uh, getting that to work. For example, if you're familiar with um, things like Dropbox or Google Drive, that helps tremendously. Like I instruct the teachers, okay, you know, have an account and that way we have a way of getting the information and the data off the iPads. Um, one thing I've told teachers, in fact it came up today, one of the biggest things teachers, a teacher asked me today is, I want to run Microsoft Word on an iPad, and I want to run Flash on an iPad. And I'm like, okay, Steve Jobs is dead, but he's still saying no Flash, so we can't do that. And so I think the point of that is that people have to understand it as a tool, but it's not the only tool and it is not the right tool for every job. You know, my husband's big into, you know, fixing things and he always says to me, use the right tool for the right job and that's what I tell the teachers. So when I had a teacher say to me, I'm going to bring all the kids into the classroom and have them create a noodle bib citation using iPads, I said, why? 
Why would you do that? Why would you make them type on an iPad when they can go to the library and use computers? So, you know, if that's possible, but some of the problem, though, is sometimes they only have iPads because they don't have a computer lab like they do at the high school, or their laptop carts are in such bad condition. So that's, that's kind of like the answer to your second question. Uh, from the first perspective, um, you know, since you're asking me, I, I feel like we, we have a, a ways to go. Right. It's but not surprising, we're at the beginning. Yeah. So. Right. But Correct. it has been a huge leap. I mean, just what we've done this year has yep. been huge. Having been in the district mm -hmm. and worked with staff, I've been on the district tech committee for many years, and I was mm -hmm. one of the ITS or instructional technology <laughs> support people for about eight years. And the fact that the iPad carts were wonderful, and like she said, it's a great tool to have, but the fact that you also put us in a support, I think that is a very key point. And then teachers have said that because they mm -hmm. said, like I said, maybe we would not have been using it as much if we just been given the tool and not the support and the you know resources to go back with it and mm -hmm. the professional development classes too have been huge like had more increased enrollment in them you know we only started them a couple of months ago but i feel like the word is out there and it's spreading but there is so much more we need to do as it is yeah that that ability to be available when they need us at their convenience is just it, it's and again the instructional technology especially they can't do that but we can so that has made a huge difference and I find people more willing to try things. Sometimes I say to them, look, I'll just come into the room, your classroom, and I'll be moral support in the back, just in case you're feeling a little uneasy. They, that little extra push of support and help, it seems to be hugely appreciated. And so I think that it has been indeed a, a giant leap in the right direction. That was just Thank you. I was just going to say, I think it's great that we have the it's only because some districts can move forward in leaps and bounds with technology and you don't have the it's helping out mm -hmm. and they just sit there, they don't get used, they don't get utilized to the full, fullest extent and there are a lot of people that need that support mm -hmm. so totally. I think that'll help our district move even further with whatever technology we move ahead with. So in your opinion, it sounds like when we purchase things in this next budget year, we should be maybe purchasing laptops as opposed to more iPads, or, or how do you feel about yeah, that? Yeah, I think, I think <laughs> that really depends upon this, the situation. Uh, for example, today I had a science teacher who wants to run this virtual pendulum lab that she runs from a website. So I tested it from an iPad, and it doesn't work because it requires Java, which is not, again, supported on an iPad. So those science teachers at the high school are much better off using their cart of laptops that they got last year than they are, generally speaking. Once in a while, there's like a great app for periodic table of the elements. You bring that into the classroom, it's great. But I, I, think that, I think that the idea is that there's not one tool that necessarily is the tool. I think to have a, a, a mix of different, sometimes it's great to have a, you know, like maybe a, a, the Max in, in like the, like um, uh, they have in the, uh, fine arts, you know, it's a it, it different tool for the job. And, and I think what's happened is, is that a lot of teachers seem to think, well, I have to use the iPads now. I'm like, use the iPads if they fit. Don't try to bend the technology, you know, to make it work. It should work for you. You shouldn't have to bend it to make it work for you. Then you're just using technology for technology's sake, which is not what we want to do. Right. So, so for example, like there's, there's something called Chromebooks that, that Google puts out that are very inexpensive. I don't know if you're familiar with them, yeah. but it's you open it up. There's and I ask teachers, well, what do you think about this idea? I give you a laptop. There's nothing on it, nothing. You open it up. You get on the internet. You can use Google Docs to create your documents and so forth. And they look at me for a second, like, oh God. And then they go, yeah, actually, that would be okay, as long as the internet's available, right? So I think it really depends who you speak to. Like somebody asked me, what do you think about getting the English teachers at the high school iPads? I, I said, I think you should talk to them. I think that if I were and I have been an English teacher. If you put me on a desert island and gave me an iPad or my MacBook as a choice, I would take my MacBook as an English teacher. I do I a lot of typing. Right. And I think last year when we did ask the English department, that was um, That's the word right. that we got. And the science department as well. That's right. That's why we got less carts of iPads in the high school. Than we, I think we were going to get four. We got two and two carts of laptops. Right. So I'm just saying, I'm sorry, just once again. So going forward, mm -hmm. would you prefer that we furnished you with iPads? or laptops? What would be, you, in your Elementary, opinion? Elementary, I would say laptops at this laptops. point. Because I think what we have is is good enough for what we have now and what we're using them for. You okay. know, and we have a card of 30 for every building. 
Okay. So it's an, it depends on how the building's using it. Building by building, it's a little bit different. So you may want to talk to principals about that. But if I was making a decision, I would say they need laptops at the elementary level. Okay. Not more iPads. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone? Um, well, first, I just want to say thank you. It's it, I learned a tremendous amount just from your presentation. <laughs> it sounds like you guys have been tremendously busy and a great resource not only to the kids but to the teachers. So. <laughs> It just, I know when we started talking about this position, it was a one year position. So I'm wondering what the conversation is going forward about having these master technology, you know, teachers in place for a long term basis. Because it sounds like one year is not enough to get the work done. And certainly that makes sense given, you know, that technology is always moving forward and changing. Is that a conversation that we're having or that w um, do we have it at budget time? Well, right, and since we're heading into budget time and our next presentation is actually on the beginning of budget process, I, you know, is one of the reasons why at mid-year we did want to hear um, what has been being accomplished, what are challenges, what are successes, et cetera, um, so that we're better informed to, to make a decision. So, but, but you're right, as part of the budget process, we're going to have to make that decision along with a few other decisions. <laughs> <laughs> so can I, can I build on that question for a second? So. With respect to teachers reaching out to you, so on, uh, I think on Nancy's, uh, maybe both of them mm -hmm. have it, there's kind of this button you can press if you want to set up an appointment you know, to get help. W what kind of adoption have you gotten for the services that you guys provide? You know, if you have 500 you know, people that could come for you, um, you know, has everybody, uh, I realize it's not everybody, <laughs> but is it 10%, 50%, 100%? You know, if we had one or two or three more master technology teachers would, you know, I, I'm trying to get a sense of how big the box mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. um, personally, at, at the elementary level, I, I have, I would say, and it, like I said, it's building by building depending on, you know, what their goals are as a school. Um, but if you take it building by building and I just generalize it all together, um, classroom wise, I've been in about 50% of all the classrooms and all the buildings because some are just focusing on K through first and some are larger. I'm talking about people I've met with on consultation basis where I, you know, like the one to one Nancy talked about in my professional development, say it's at least 75% of the teachers I've, you know, touch. been in touch with. You know, it might have been just like one consultation we've met and discussed a lesson and then they've gone back and used it. There are some teachers I've been in three or four times, but I would say one to one it's about 75% of the teachers that are out there and my experience varies by building I mean the high school has been huge but I think the big reason for that well there's two reasons there's no instructional technology specialist at the high school so there's been no one helping the teachers with technology I actually was doing that in my role as a media specialist the other reason I think it's so big at the high school is because they just know me you know people are in the habit of coming to me anyway and so this is just a natural extension of that um, I feel personally like I'm just starting to hit my stride. It's taken me a while, as one of the principals said to me, it's hard to become part of the culture of a building. And I struggled with that with the middle schools. And Roosevelt, it's, you know, Stu has been so great because he basically, he basically told them, look, she's going to be here on Tuesday mornings. You, everybody has to go see her. So I was like, oh, like I said in the room, I was like, you know, it's great though, because people just stop by just to say hello. Sometimes they talk to me. And in Edison, it's the same way. I, I kind of go to the teacher's lounge. I sit in the room. So I do a variety of things. Sometimes I think I do a lot more one-on-one -on -one with teacher consultations than I do in the classroom. I do go into classrooms, but I, I find myself being asked by teachers for one-on-one -on -one help more frequently than anything else. Um, of course, I do the tech talks. People come to those at the various buildings and the professional development. So, so I have hit a very good uh, number of people but I think part of the thing, and I've talked to Paul about this, that I've struggled with is how do I reach those people that are non-tech people? Because you always get those same people that are really into it and they're willing to learn anything. How do I encourage those other people? Well, you, to you kind of you went down the path of where I was hoping yeah. you were going to go. So mm -hmm. how, how do you engage those folks that won't come to you? Well, you know, like in the teacher's lounge at Edison, nobody was talking to me, but the, the copy machine is there. <laughs> so they'd start copying, and i just say, well, what, what are you working on? And, uh, you know, I gave two teachers great <laughs> ideas just when they were using the copy machine. So you have to kind of be creative and be where they are. So I do spend dedicated time in each of the middle schools once one morning a week where, and I tell them, I send them emails, I remind them, 
the vice principals make announcements, Ms. Latimer's in the building, you know, to try to get them to come in and, and talk to me. Um, has it been 100% effective? Probably not, but it's still kind of a work in progress. You know, we, we, somebody said to us recently, oh, you know, it's only been four months, right? We were like, oh, it's only been four months. It seems a lot longer, but I think we're our own um, worst critics because we want to reach everyone, and sometimes it's, it's a challenge. I've also done at the elementary level, um, I sent out weekly emails to all the staff, so everyone has to get one, and I've been accused of sending out too many emails. Um, but I kind of try to put us out there and put as much PR out there for us as well. Um, I found that one of the ways is through the blog and putting out, specifically when we have teacher examples of things that are going on in other rooms, because a lot of teachers don't know where to start, so just seeing what other teachers are doing. Um, one of the other ways is because they have the grade levels in the elementary schools, is if I schedule something with two grade level teachers and I know there's two others I haven't I'll say I'll put it out there saying I'm gonna be in your building teaching this to these two do you want to schedule with me and I have had some positive feedback that way I've had people who said come in and do that lesson with my students as well do we run the risk of, of being inconsistent ac across classes within a grade and, and at different schools because we're we're kind of allowing the adoption of these resources to be driven by the teachers as opposed to pushed by us a little bit more. Um, sure, yeah, please, sure, please, please do. I'll, I'll let Mr. Pinera right. talk to um, us. I'd like to thank uh, Nancy and Janine for, for getting up to speed on what they've been up to. They do a great job. The speed with <clears throat> which they deliver that, because I told them we have a long agenda and I'm, I guess, just taking up more time, is sort of akin to the speed with which uh, they get from building to building and do their jobs. They're covering a lot of ground. So back to your question, Mark, about how do we know we're reaching that whole group? Uh, or as many as possible. In addition to some of the things that the two ladies mentioned, um, I've met with the principals in, re in just the last few weeks to ask that same question because the momentum of those who are very eager uh, can swallow up, I guess, just two people. So in speaking with the, the K-5 elementary principals at their one of their Monday meetings, uh, I posed the, that very question. And we talked a little bit about uh, the different levels which are indicated a little bit by the survey that we did at the beginning of the year so we got a sense of what might be a, a requirement so to speak or some some way to get uh, teachers into this flow of using the master technology teachers and technology and we came up with um, some basic levels that the principals would require across the board K through 5 and it could be something as simple as uh, how to use cloud-based storage for full full-time access 24 7 access to your stuff so in the case of um, the literacy initiative for example if they decided to learn you know teachers who might be considered novice uh, how to use Dropbox or for more advanced people it might be something like Google Drive then they can get uh, familiar with this which would save them time and make them maybe more efficient and help them organize and so at, at that level we're helping them not putting something else on their plate because you know there is a lot going on in the district as, as you can tell and um, I think for those teachers who are early adopters or even novices, it's a big deal to start thinking of how will I apply that amazing technology in my world. So we'd like to start with the novices by helping them organize access and start to implement even on that basic level. So for example, the principals have decided across the board that that, uh, that would be a good place to start, managing your data and having full access to it at home, at work. And uh, from there, you have shared files. So it's a really good uh, ent entry way into um, using technology for collaborative and creative purposes um, and communication and so forth. Uh, similarly, uh, the principals are having conversations at the intermediate and high school. Um, but I think it's particularly an issue with the literacy initiative uh, at the elementaries going on. So that's one way that we're going to try to make sure that it's even. And uh, I feel comfortable with that for sure. And uh, I think once teachers start getting, uh, you know, a little bit of their own momentum, they get a little bit more, and uh, you know, familiar and comfortable, and they'll look to do uh, more things. Have you ever? Hey. Oh, yeah. no, have you ever, you know, maybe on in an in-house PD or maybe at a team meeting? You know, I think sometimes teachers get intimidated yeah. when. You have a technology right. workshop, We've, and it's everyone included. Right. Maybe differentiate we, the teachers. <laughs> thank <laughs> you, know? you. You actually reminded me of, of an, a crucial missing part, and that's that um, we've scheduled uh, Janine to attend grade level <coughs> meetings. Uh, there's an opening for the rest of the year for each grade level, 
and uh, she'll be designated to attend those grade level meetings and do either an overview as I've mentioned or others that might pop up as, as they become aware that she'll be visiting. So they're scheduled out for the year to do exactly that. Because um, I think then Janine will definitely be aware of those teachers that need that push mm -hmm. and maybe then can schedule a workshop right. or a meeting with mm -hmm. them, you know. We've also published uh, the, the professional development guide for this year is, a, is very much technology driven. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's another resource that principals have said that um, they may ask teachers to go through and pick one thing between now and the end of the year, at least one thing mm -hmm. that they'd like them to experience. There may be more. So there's a lot. Some of them are repeated. Some of them are two or three days of courses or training. Some of them are one day. Uh, some of them are entry level. Some of them are very sophisticated and so forth. So between, uh, I, I think it was key that at the principals and supervisors meeting uh, last week, uh, myself and Dr. Dolan and, uh, provided this kind of overview for them and invited them to use those kinds of uh, avenues to, to get the, all teachers involved. And then uh, Nancy and Janine also came to the supervisors meeting and did this presentation for them. And uh, that momentum is there. At, at this point, I think, um, I think they're gonna get a lot, you know, I, I think they're already busy. They're gonna get busier if that's possible, but uh, they'll just have to, like we always do, give more people in a room and then, you know, we'll just keep keep moving forward. But I think that, you know, it was built and people were coming and now we want to make sure that no one's left behind. I guess that's the way I would look at this initiative with regard to the master technology teachers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And for our second superintendent report this evening, um, as briefly mentioned, this is also um, the time where we start to prepare for our budget for the 2013-14 year and um, to introduce about the budget process and the preliminary calendar for this uh, is our business administrator, Dana Sullivan. Thank you. Okay, so of course the budget is needs to be balanced between the district needs, goals, priorities, um, state mandates, core curriculum standards. Um, there's many things on, on that side of the equation. It has to be balanced with the dollars that we have available. Um, as you know, the state now has a 2% increase on the tax levy. That is the maximum amount that we are allowed to increase. Um, anything above that would have to be um, voted on as a separate proposal, and that would go to a vote in November. Um, but any the budget that we will adopt in the next come few months will be either a two percent cap or less. So the budget process really starts in October and November, um, and it starts with the goals and priorities for the district, which are developed by the board and the administration. Um, along with those goals, the board has to develop some budget assumptions around tax levy um, as I stated the tax levy could go up 2% it also could, could go up less than 2% um, we have to make some assumptions about state aid um, we're, we're hoping that state aid will either stay stable or actually increase um, but we don't have any definite information about that at this point point. Um, and as we know in the last several years we have seen some wide variations on what, what has happened with state aid um, the board will have to make some uh, decisions around tax relief and the amount of fund balance that's used for tax relief. Um, and also fund balance and how much you're going to use for maintenance and capital reserve accounts. And we will have to develop a calendar that's um, developed in, in accordance with state guidelines and state um, statute for the board's and the community's review and for the board's approval. So in the fall, again, the administration starts looking at district needs. Um, we start looking at enrollment, current enrollment and projections for the following year as well as several years out. Um, we look at curriculum, um, core, how we're meeting the core curriculum content standards and what our needs are um, in that area. We look at state mandates, um, of which there are many, as you know. Um, special education is a, is a significant part of the budget and also is um, extremely mandated by law. Um, and transportation is an example, but we certainly have other mandates that um, we're required to look at when we develop our budget. 
Um, we have contractual obligations, um, mostly around our um, employees and um, certain benefits and salaries that they're <coughs> entitled to through their contracts. Um, health and safety, of course, every year is, a, is an issue that the district has to pay attention to for our students as well as our staff. Um, and building maintenance. Um, because we have schools that are in buildings that are very old, um, building maintenance is constantly a priority in the district. In addition to that, we also have certain priorities from year to year that um, the district focuses attention on. Um, one of the things that we've been looking at is the teachers reading and writing program, teachers college reading and writing program, and um, we're looking to continue that program next year. Um, obviously, we just spoke for a long time about technology and the technology initiative, and we'll be looking to continue um, to support that initiative in the next 13-14 budget and probably beyond that. Um, our facilities, as I mentioned, continue to be a priority in the district, and how do we fund our maintenance and capital reserve accounts um, in order to meet those needs. Um, professional development is a priority for the district in training our staff in the various initiatives that we spoke about. And security, of course, is always um, a top priority for us, but because of the recent events in, in Newtown, Connecticut, it has been moved to the top of li the list this year, um, and everybody is looking at um, different ways that maybe we can provide security or improve security in our school buildings. So where, where does the money come from to fund the district, to fund the budget? Um, in the 12-13 budget, which is the current year we were in, Almost 90% of that budget came from local taxes. Um, the state average in New Jersey is about 52% is funded by local taxes. Now, of course, the large urban districts tend to be more in the 90%, 80, 80 to 90% range. Um, so that, of course, throws off that average a little bit, um, where the wealthier districts do tend to be heavily supported by local taxes, and we certainly fit into that category. Um, all of our other revenue is, um, you can see, comes from very small, very small sources for the rest of that revenue. State aid is about 4.2 percent of the revenue. Federal aid is less than 2 percent of the revenue. And miscellaneous is all of the other categories of, aid, of um, income that we have. That would be building rentals, tuition for any out-of-district students that might attend our classes, special ed or regular ed. Um, as well as also our subscription busing revenue also would be in that category. Um, and then the remaining revenue is from our fund balance, which is about 1.5% of our revenue. At this point, we've been told that our state aid information will come from, will be re released on February 28th. Um, at the first draft of the budget is due to the county office on March 7th. So that gives us one week from the receipt of state aid till we actually submit the budget to the county office. Um, so as I mentioned, the areas that will have to be determined once we finalize our state aid numbers, we'll have to make decisions about our fund balance and how much of that we will use for our tax relief. We'll make an estimate of our other income, um, as I mentioned, and then we'll determine how much the tax levy that we need to support our budget. And where does the money go? So this breaks down the, the how the money is spent. About 67% of the budget is on instruction. And this these numbers include benefits for staff. Um, so almost 70% of our budget is for instructional costs. Um, administration is 8.9%. Is um, transportation is 2.7%. Um, child study team, I can't read the number on my Thank you. Um, nurses, guidance, and librarians is about 6.4 percent. Uh, maintenance is 7.8 percent. And as I mentioned, because our buildings are so old, we do s spend a significant amount of money at maintaining our buildings. Um, and then the other areas of the budget are uh, very small in 0.1 percent, 0.2 percent. Um, athletics is 1.1 percent, also a very small part of our budget. Um, and our debt service is about 3 percent. So when we start building the expenditure side of the budget, um, in order to be equitable among the schools, we determine an amount that each school um, 
gets as an allocation, it's um, a set amount for elementary, middle, and then high school. Um, and that covers all of their supplies, materials, textbooks, and all of their building-based costs except for their salaries. Each department will develop their budget based on um, any needs that they have, uh, taking into account, of course, any all the state mandates that they need to um, make sure their department is in compliance with state statutes. Um, superintendent and myself review each school and each department budget with the appropriate administrator. Um, and of course, we all as a district, but especially at the central office, look to um, implement additional cost savings to increase savings that we are currently um, benefiting from um, and reviewing other areas where we can save money either by sharing services or uh, just reducing um, our, our purchases. Once all of this information is given to me and reviewed with the superintendent, I develop the budget, um, the first draft of the budget. Um, so we look at the expenditure side to determine where are we relative to the cap. Are we at, above, or below? Um, if the budget is above the cap, of course, the first thing we have to do is figure out how to get down to the cap, um, unless the board, you know, wanted to go for a, a separate proposal and put a question up in November, which is usually not likely. Um, so we would determine, the superintendent and I would determine what areas um, are not mandates that could be recommended for reductions. And then the budget is presented the, to the Finance Committee for their review and comments. The budget is presented, of course, to the Board of Education and the community. Um, the Board of Ed will adopt a tentative budget that is submitted to the Union County Executive Superintendent. Um, after their review, we do advertise that budget in, in paper and advertise our public hearing. Um, the board will hold, then hold a public hearing and adopt the final budget. So this is our calendar as of now. We still don't have exact timelines from the state, but we do have enough guidance at this point that I think these dates are going to be pretty close. Um, our next board meeting will be February 19th. Of course, we will not have state aid information at that point, so we will start presenting the expenditure side of the budget um, with estimates of where we think the revenue side is going to be and where we think we are relative to the cap. On February 28th, we'll receive state aid, so that could either change the budget entirely or, or not, depending on what happens on that date. Um, on March 5th, we have a board meeting. We'll again continue our presentations and discussions. And there will be public comment at all of these um, board meetings, by the way. On March 5th, the board will have to adopt a tentative budget. And what that means is you're approving the submission of the budget to the county superintendent. It doesn't mean that you can't make changes after that date. Um, but it just means you're approving the submittal to, to the county superintendent. Um, they will review that at their level. Um, they will come back to us sometime probably by March, I don't know, 15th or so with an approval to advertise. Um, we will then have to advertise the budget in the paper and advertise our public hearing. On March 19th, we will have a public meeting again and discussion of the budget. And then on March 21st, we'll have our public hearing. Um, we will at that point probably adopt the budget if there are a lot of comments um, about the budget and the board is not is still considering making changes we will add a special meeting the following week um, the problem that we have the following week is that schools are closed that week for spring break Monday and Tuesday is Passover and Thursday is Holy Thursday and Friday is Good Friday so if we have to have a special meeting that week it'll be Wednesday <laughs> um, we don't know the state could possibly push off that, that final adoption date, which right now is about the 30th, um, to the following week. I, I don't have any reason to, to think at this point they will. So this is the calendar as of now that we're going to follow. And um, as soon as I get more information, if it's different, I'll, I will let you know. And that's our presentation for tonight. Are there any questions? Um, thank you. I think this is really a question for Dr. Dolan, but maybe not. <laughs> um, under district priorities, you said that security had moved to the top of the list. And I was just wondering when the board was going to discuss security and maybe um, 
hear recommendations of various things that you want to update or change in the district? Sure. I mean, there are some um, immediate issues that we're taking care of in buildings and continue to be. Um, but we also continue to have um, meetings. We had one this afternoon, um, which was the District Emergency Management Committee, um, chaired by Dr. Weissman, and we had the police chief was in attendance again. Um, again, reviewing various options, um, looking at both the differences in our schools and, the, um, and yet we want to have one cohesive plan. So, um, I, we can give an update to the board, um, you know, we can set a time and tell you where we are at that point, um, but it's going to be continuous. Um, it, it, there are a lot of steps that are going to be taken long term. Again, some, some ones were done immediate and continue to be as soon as we're uh, made, suggestions are made by the police, but I can certainly talk to the uh, leadership of the board and we can schedule a session. Um, and again, the, the work is continuous. I'm just remembering Dana and um, Mike Weissman were at a state meeting mm -hmm. just this past Friday. Mm -hmm. Others of us are scheduled to go to a county meeting in the next weeks. Uh, there's a lot of work going on. There's talk that um, there's going to be some federal money available for schools, and we need to know uh, the direction they're going there so that can become part of a cohesive plan so while parents already certainly can notice a change in security in each of the buildings and so can students but um, um, but parents certainly can um, there will be um, more and more ones as we work through all of the guidance that we're receiving and also see if there are opportunities for any grants going forward. And then again, we can make a formal presentation to the board um, whenever board leadership thinks it's a good time to schedule it. So it's my understanding, I haven't been to every school in the last year, but I think that um, you have to buzz to get into every school except the high school. Is that correct? Um, th there well? is a buzzer at the high school, but not at uh, a main entrance, yes. So, is that one thing that we're considering? Uh, absolutely. Looking at the high school, and we absolutely are, and we are looking to make sure that the we, we have one proposal for what to actually we have more than one proposal for what to do with that entrance. So, while there are some things we actually other changes have been made for that entrance immediately, so that it is secure. But the long term, the more long term solution as to how to change that entrance, um, I think we have three different ways that we're looking at it and continue to talk, for example, with the, with the police department as to what they think is the best solution. Mm -hmm. So where there is a, a, a quick change, those have been done. Um, we've also piloted a few things in a few, uh, a few schools to see which is the best solution. Mm -hmm. um, and, where, and when we are making something that is a more major change, that costs more money. Um, we want to make sure we're, make, we're making the best choice. As a matter of fact, as part of today's meeting, we did have someone come in talking about how technology can help your security in various ways. And um, it was actually a pretty lively, lively discussion. I don't think everything that was suggested is appropriate for Westfield. One of the other difficulties is, honestly, um, you don't want to give the details of your security plan. And part of security is not telling everyone what every uh, you know what every detail is of a plan you don't post what your emergency plans are we, we have emergency drills and plans in all of our schools but, but it's not something you're going to post on the internet or discuss the details because then it wouldn't be a security plan and trust me the police chief does remind me of that fairly frequently so um, while we could do a presentation that would be fine um, if I'm vague I, I'll tell you that that's intentional um, because that doesn't help if we tell all details. Uh, students need to know expectations, parents need to know what they can expect when they come to a school, staff need to understand expectations, but um, again, we're not going to talk about all the details of, of each of the buildings because that wouldn't be helpful. Right. Well, no, I wasn't suggesting that. No, part, I know but I what I guess the board needs to look at is if we are going to spend money to change uh, you know, an entrance way or put up cameras or whatever it is, uh, you know, I think at some point, absolutely, fairly soon, we would need to discuss that. Right. Agreed. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? 
Any other superintendents? No, that's the only ones for tonight. All right. With that, I'd ask the board to approve the minutes of the board meeting held on January 3, 2013, special board meeting on January 8, 2013, and the private session minutes of January 3, 2013, and January 8, 2013. Have a second? Second. Ginny, uh, any comments or questions? I abstain on the third, on anything that was the third. And I will abstain on anything from the eighth. Okay, you got that, Dan? Yep. Any other comments, questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any objections? Any abstentions other than noted? Well, I guess I abstain on part of the meeting on the 8th, right? I was only there for the beginning part. Okay, so the, no, you'll no, have to abstain on the, on the whole thing. On the whole thing. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, personnel items, Mark? Okay, um, I'd like to ask the board to consider personnel motions one through 18. We'll do this in two separate parts. So one through 18. Second. Questions, comments? I have um, one retirement, if I could speak to that. Please. So after almost 30 years in the Westfield schools, Mario Sulo, Edison's head custodian, is retiring. He began in the district as a custodian at Roosevelt, and then moved to night custodian Edison, and then became head custodian in 1994. Mario often re refers to Edison as his second home, and I have to tell you that's exactly what you want your head custodian to believe, to truly believe, not just to say. And he and his staff work hard so that students and staff can be proud of their building. He can often be, be seen on his own time during weekends weeding the flower beds at Edison, which is only one of the main indications of how willing Mario is to go the extra mile for his building. Everyone at, will, at Edison will miss him, and we wish him well in his retirement. Thank you very much. Anna, please. Rich Matesik? Yes. Lucy Beegler? Yes. Ann Carey? Yes. Mark Friedman? Yes. Brendan Galligan? Yes. Roseanne Kerstead? Yes. Ginny Lights? Yes. Gretchen Oli? Yes. Okay, and then uh, I'd like to ask the board to consider personnel motion 19 as amended. It should be at your desk, uh, given to you by uh, Barbara for the meeting. Um, questions? Comments? Oh, I, I second the motion. Oh, sorry. Okay. I missed that. Uh, I have a comment. Uh, so we, we've seen from uh, the supervisor of athletics in one of our prior meetings that we're going to be changing the process uh, by which she's evaluating and then uh, uh, recommending uh, coaches. So um, until that, it goes into effect, which I believe is for the next season after this one. So for next fall, um, I'm going to be voting no uh, on these coaching assignments. Anybody else? Questions? Dana? Rich Matesik? Yes. Lucy Beegler? Yes. Ann Carey? Yes. Mark Friedman? No. Brandon Galligan? Yes. Roseanne Kerstead? Yes. Ginny Lights? Yes. Gretchen Oleg? Yes. That's it. Uh, personal item number 20. The addendum. The addendum. Ah. Sorry, I would have done that together. Okay. Um, so I would like to ask the board to consider personnel motion number 20. Uh, that was added uh, before the meeting. I'd like second. to second that. I'm sorry, who seconded? Jenny did. Sorry. Yeah. Questions or comments? Okay, Dana. Rich Matesik? Yes. Lucy Beegler? Yes. Ann Carey? Yes. Mark Friedman? Yes. Brendan Galligan? Yes. Roseanne Kersted? Yes. Ginny Lights? Yes. Gretchen Oleg? Yes. Mm -hmm. With that, I'll go to facilities. Uh, I have no formal report for facilities. I would note that the committee did meet uh, two times over the past week uh, to talk uh, first about the five-year facility plan uh, to begin to understand uh, from Dana and Mike Morris, our supervisor of buildings and grounds, what is in the plan, uh, what the needs were communicated from the various buildings. Uh, and so we've identified uh, a lot of those items. Uh, there are a number of items we're waiting for cost estimates on. And once we have that data, uh, we'll get back together to prioritize 
and establish a recommendation uh, for the coming budget cycle. The second meeting was more specific to uh, a discussion about uh, what amount, if any, we would uh, put in a longer term uh, capital account. So we have uh, maintenance reserves and capital reserves as distinguished by uh, content, the, the types of things you can spend those reserves on. Um, and then typically in my mind, uh, capital reserves being longer term in nature. And so we discussed um, the kinds of things that we might want to uh, establish a long term savings for. Uh, this is something that board members raised in, in various discussions uh, of the roofs and the recent bond referendums. Um, and that is something we'll come back to the full board with uh, in the recommendation that uh, we carry forward in the budget process. Long range planning, Jenny? Yes, um, I plan to have the committee meet within the next two weeks to review projected enrollments for budget planning and also to assess the impact on current attendance zones. Thank you. All right, policies, uh, Gretchen. Uh, actually, Roseanne's going to report for policies. The policies are at our table tonight were when Roseanne was still the chair of the committee. So. Okay. so I'd like to ask the board to approve for first reading the following policies. 1240, superintendent evaluation. 2415.04, Title I, district-wide parental involvement. 5111, eligibility of resident, non-resident pupils. 5465, early graduation. And 84... Um, six, can I start a new motion? <laughs> a mid motion? Yes, because you don't have a second. Okay, so I'd like to restate my motion. I'd, I'd like the board to approve for first reading the following policies. 2415.04, 5111, 5465, and 8464. Second. Thank you, Gretchen. Um, Discussion or questions? Well, I'll give a discussion. 2415.04, the Title I proposal uh, policy. Um, some comments that I got from some board members I'd just like to review before we do approve this for first reading on page two of five. <clears throat> two C. Um, annual presentation of student assessment performance. Those are not capitalized because it is not a one thing. Um, D, the ad hoc advisory committee. It's not a committee of the board and we consider our ad hoc committees committees of the board. So it's being changed to ad hoc parent committee. You want to keep it ad hoc? I thought we had decided to without the capital. Oh, I thought you were just going to call it parent committees. That's fine. Parent committees. Is that okay? With people? Parent committees. And then on page three of five, five A. <laughs> There's an S at the end of survey. And on 5C, I'm going to read this. A review of all evaluative feedback and data by the Title I funded schools, apostrophe, principals. The assistant superintendent, now Dr. Dolan, we were talking, the assistant superintendent referenced here is for curriculum instruction and programming. That's that correct. correct. That's correct. So we're just going to add curriculum instruction and programming because we have more than one assistant superintendent. Um, page four of five, line one. The school district will build the schools, that's S apostrophe, not apostrophe S, and parents. S apostrophe, not apostrophe S. And then 1A, no, 1B, there's an S in improvement at the end of improvement plans. And we're going to add in C, student progress report. Cool. Just to be clear. On page 5 of 5, 
three B will change to parent committees, like on the previous page. Number five A will read place flyers in backpacks. B will read post information on district website, semicolon and. And C will read post information on NCLB slash Title I parent resource page on school district website. So are there any comments or questions on those edits? Yeah, yeah. One See more. one more. <laughs> Adoption, the final page. Yes, the first uh, uh, phrase. Let's put Title I in there to define district-wide parent improvement. Oh, okay. The Parental. Title I district. Yeah. Right. Which okay. is the name of the policy. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, 5111, the elev eligibility of resident and non-resident pupils. There is an addendum. There is a revised policy on your desk, the page that is revised. It's red and purple. There you go. Page seven of seven. Uh, as you can see, it said INS approved institution. There is no longer an INS. It is United States Department of Homeland Security. So that has been changed. The word may to shall has been changed to make it stronger. And then the, the date specific, the timeliness of the paragraph with November 1996 was scratched out. It's not necessary. Yes. Roseanne, um, at the end of the first paragraph, yes. there's a conversation about funding. Um, and this is about. Uh, granting support for uh, the um, institu the educational institution to qualify the student for an F-1 visa. And this final requirement is sufficient funds to cover the first year of study, access to sufficient funds to cover subsequent years, and yet in the third paragraph mm -hmm. it says that students could only attend a secondary school for a maximum of 12 months. Um, and that elementary students, in the second paragraph, are not, foreign students are not admitted to elementary school. So is there a conflict between wanting to know whether there's funding <coughs> for subsequent years, but the maximum is a 12-month school period of time? Uh, the state requirement, uh, the State Department has specific guidelines about both of those. They mentioned both of them on their website about funding for, for, for additional years plus the requirements about only one year of study. So I don't get it. Why is there a maximum of 12 months if they want to know that whether there's money available for more than 12 months of schooling? In case they change their mind. <laughs> no, it's not good enough for me. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. But <laughs> um, all I is that a conflict? This is what it, this is what we were given by Strauss Esme. Right. This is what we were, as Brendan alluded to, is on the state website and has been checked by our lawyers. So I am um, <laughs> okay. It, it just seems to me to I, be. Yeah, I, I understand yes, the question. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Okay, I registered my concern. <laughs> and, and, and we yeah. can see if there's, there's an answer from the state for second reading. Uh, but we did yes. review it, as you said, and, um, and took it from the information available. But um, sure. Th that phrase to cover subsequent yes. years yes. just seems um, gratuitous. Yeah, I don't know what's there for. I don't, I don't know where it's leading us to understand. Right. No. Okay. So I'll ask about that. Thank you. Again. Again. Um, and then early graduation. Oh, excuse me. Yep. Um, page 7 of 15, the next page that oh. you gave us. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Seven. Oh, we're not. That's the next. Uh, oh, right. Yeah. Right. Um, 
Number yeah. three at the top of the page. Yeah. It's a poorly worded sentence. The district school accepts F1 visa pupils. I'm sorry. With the payment of tuition, <laughs> with the tuition contract to be signed before the district will provide the requested form. Couldn't we put the phrase? Do you um, just want to replace with with provided provided a tuition con contract to sign? That would be all right. Payment of tuition provided. Well, the idea is that the oh wait the re the requested form, which which really is not the I twenty, it's I dash twenty A dash B. Right. There's there's yeah. more information on the form on the name of the form itself. I dash twenty A dash B. That form will be provided only after or or the district will accept visa only after receiving the signed contract and full payment. Seems to me that those things have to come first. Anyway, I I would prefer that you rewrite the sentence. <coughs> Question, okay. whatever you come so up we'll with is fine. Thanks. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Um, 5465 early graduation is also at your table with some additional revisions. In the second paragraph, there was mention of demonstration of proficiencies on two different assessments, one being the HESPA. And the second one was AHSA, which was not consistent with what was spelled out in one. So we just made that more consistent. So it's high school competency assessments. And now it is, excuse me, in line. In that paragraph, I yeah. think we should reference, or should we say HESPA or the HSCA? Should we add? or such other successor state required or mandated tests so that if there are other ones we don't have to the, um, the there is no hsca that is a generic title that's not so, that a, would capture. so that's okay the hespa yes you could either say state approved or state required high school assessments or you could do what you just suggested either way i kind of like the I mean, the HESPA is changing, so yes. when, so I like the state approved. State, state approved mm -hmm. high I school assessment. I think that's assessments. smarter, right? Yes. State approved proficiency assessment. Is that yes? Or high school assessment. High, high school, school high school assessment. Okay, and then we'll change that in one as well. You know what, I'm sorry, I think it should be state required, not state approved. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's whatever is required at the time, state enforced at the time. High school assessment. Mm -hmm. Proficient or advanced proficient. You'll figure it out. And in all sections of the state required <coughs> high school assessment. Okay. Any other comments or questions? We're just putting 1240 off. I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to okay. do that in a second. Okay, Dane, I think we're good. Rich Matesic? Yes. Lucy Beegler? Yes. Ann Carey? Yes. Mark Friedman? Yes. Brendan Galligan? Yes. Roseanne Kerstead? Yes. Ginny Lights? Yes. Gretchen Oleg? Yes. <laughs> um, after speaking with some board members, <clears throat> I think that once again we should table the superintendent evaluation, which is why I did not move for it to be approved. So we can have more time to really look at the policy and see if it not only is represents our current policy, our current practices, but whether that is in fact the practices we want to happen. And we have new board members who have not been through the process, and so I think it would serve this board in the long run better if we took our time with this policy. A little more time. The policy committee has taken time, but I think we need a little more time for the whole board to really vet it out. Take a look. 
So that's why that has been tabled. And now I would like the oh, board wait. to. We what? need to vote on that. Oh, do I need to vote on the fact that it's tabling? Oh. Yes. Okay. It's I'd like to move agenda. that the board approve the tabling of 1240 superintendent evaluation. Second. Can I have a second? Thank you, Brendan. Comments or questions? Let's vote. Rich Matesic? Yes. Lucy Beegler? Yes. Ann Carey? Yes. Mark Friedman? Yes. Brendan Galligan? Yes. Roseanne Kerstead? Yes. Ginny Lights? Yes. Gretchen Olick? Yes. Now I'd like to ask now I'd like to ask the board to affirm the superintendent's decision on 13WA02, 13WA03, 13WA04, 13WA05, 13F01, 13R01 for the reasons set forth therein. May I have a second? Thank you, Ginny. Are there any questions or comments? Rich Matesic? Yes. Lucy Beegler? Yes. Ann Carey? Yes. Mark Friedman? Yes. Brendan Galligan? Yes. Roseanne Kerstead? Yes, except for 13F01, I'm voting no. No on 13F01? Yes. Ginny Lights? Yes. Gretchen Oleg. I abstain. Okay. That's it. That's it. Curriculum instruction and programs. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> I would like to ask the board to approve for first reading the following curricula. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Gretchen. Um, as you can see, we have um, some French curricula up for review. These are all revised classes. They are not new. I'm just going to read you a little bit about them. The study of French is a valuable skill that enables its learners to gain an appreciation of the many diverse aspects of the Francophone culture, people, and language. French is spoken officially in 33 countries and is the official working language of many international organizations including the United Nations and the International Olympic Committee. Learners of French exam students in our district and learners of French examine and discover the unique facets of the language and people who speak it, as well as the countries where it is spoken. The study of the language allows students to recognize the rich and unique cultures where French is spoken, promoting cross-cultural communication and understanding. Furthermore, the study of French allows for learners to become proficient communicators while also becoming familiar with the culture, history, and current issues of the people that the language represents. Um, as many of you know, as some of you might not know, all of our curricula are reviewed on a five-year cycle. So these curricula have been revised because they are, it's their term in the five-year cycle. So much of the contents of the course has remained, courses have remained the same. Um, the largest difference was in French grades seven and eight because they found that there was a heavy, there had been a heavy emphasis on grammar in the seventh grade. And they found that the students were not able to retain that information in the seventh grade and the complexities of the grammar and they found they were spending a lot of time reteaching that grammar in the eighth grade. So they did a little redistribution of skills and topics. So they moved much of that grammar into the eighth grade, which they found they were already teaching because the students were not retaining it from seventh grade. Um, and then in the ninth, in the French one, French two, and French two honors, the curriculum has been revised a little bit to be more in line with the new AP regulations and organization, which are more communicative um, in nature. Are there any questions or comments? Rich Matesic? Yes. Lucy Beegler? Yes. Ann Carey? Yes. Mark Friedman? Yes. Brendan Galligan? Yes. Roseanne Kerstead? Yes. Ginny Lights? <coughs> yes. Gretchen Oleg? Yes. All right. My name is Mark. 
I would like the board to consider finance motions 1 through 15. And just a couple of comments on number 14. I want to just ask for a second. Sorry? Just ask for a second. No. Second. 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 Sorry. Okay. Now it's it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Well, Rich told me if I messed up that I'd read about it tomorrow. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, the district would like to accept a gift from Mr. Ludlam to the Fine Arts Department of an Artley clarinet. Thank you very much. Uh, and then also the district would like to accept gifts from the Westfield Coalition for the Arts to be used as follows uh, for the purchase of a 55-inch LCD television uh, wall mount uh, and associated cables for Roosevelt Intermediate School Art Classroom and then also for the purchase of 75 Wenger music stands to the Fine Arts Department. We thank you very much. Any questions or comments? Dana. Rich Matesic? Yes. Lucy Beagler? Yes. Ann Carey? Yes. Mark Friedman? Yes. Brendan Galligan? Yes. Rosanna Kerstead? Yes. Ginny Lights? Yes. Gretchen Olick? Yes. With that, I'd ask the board to note the notes for the record. <coughs> Legislation. Oh, I have no report tonight. Thank you. Any unfinished business? Any, any new business? Any ad hoc committee reports from anyone which is absent? Uh, I'll get the look at something. Uh, the ad hoc technology committee met on January 11th. We had a very informative. Uh, conversation with a representative of Blackboard Software. This is uh, the company that is taking over School <coughs> Center, which is the company that runs our uh, website. So the uh, representative gave us uh, a walkthrough um, of what Blackboard's um, website support uh, looks like. And um, we're very excited to know that um, this is part of the migration that um, we will experience regardless um, of choices that we may make in the future. But it actually could have been and may be a choice that we make in addition to embrace uh, Blackboard as the uh, platform uh, for our, um, our district website as it moves into its next evolutionary stage. Um, it has a, uh, a broader functionality and um, while we'll talk about other uh, website uh, platforms, uh, it looks like a, a reasonable starting point um, and it's um, to our advantage that School Center, which now is supporting our website, actually is going to transform into this um, into this new platform so we're going to keep an eye on that and we're also we were talking about um, the security aspect <coughs> of um, having a website based uh, at off-site servers so that during um, unforeseen uh, emergency situations or natural disasters uh, we would not lose uh, accessibility to a website so that's uh, very much in our um, the forefront of our conversation as well. Okay. I'd also like to add that some members of the Ad Hoc te Technology Committee as well as people in the district are going to Texpo next week, mm -hmm. which is a large conference um, in Atlantic City. And actually, Mitch Slater will be on a panel um, discussing the use of social media in times of emergencies and how that can help your public and your community uh, work together. Okay. All right, any other reports? Any liaison reports? You want to give us? Um, sure. On um, January 17th, Ginny and I attended the general, the PTC general meeting. Um, Mike Weissman gave a very thorough presentation about safety and security in the district and steps that are being taken, um, steps that have already been in place for quite a long time and then it's that how we're expanding on those steps uh, since the tragedy in Newtown. Um, there was um, some discussion, uh, you know, anecdotal discussion about things that are happening in isolated buildings and, um, and I think it was 
good for everyone to hear that the district is, you know, actively working on trying to come up with some additional solutions to further keep our kids safe. Um, and then I'll just also mention that on the 7th, that later that day, I also attended the Jefferson School PTO meeting where some of similar issues were raised specifically with regard to that school. So I think um, it's really useful for us to get the word out that, you know, I think that people didn't know a lot of what we had. Mm -hmm. well, the district had in place that we had a committee that met on a monthly basis and that we have a plan that's reviewed annually and is reviewed by the state. Um, so I think that's really useful information to get out there, but then also to supplement it with what we're doing now, so. And it was tremendously beneficial to have uh, Dr. Weisberg there to um, lead the discussion as he is the um, chairman of the Committee of uh, Safety and Emergency Preparedness and also to hear the comments that different parents had about the um, situations that they had encountered and or questions about um, areas of, of security within the schools. One question that they'd asked was uh, about our support of um, schools being open on election day. So it was an opportunity to uh, discuss the <coughs> fact that uh, Dr. Dolan, you have been asked, uh, have been asking the board of county board of elections to um, designate different voting places for polling sites than the schools. Right, we've actually, um, I have not sent that letter, by the way, yet, um, but we have determined that there actually is an organization that uh, is asking for that. It's a, a movement that is saying it, it really is time to change that um, um, that pattern of holding elections in schools, because there's not just one election day a year. Uh, it's fine to say closed for one day, but there's not. I mean, there also, there's a primary, you know, and so um, uh, maybe it's a time to look at other places. So yes, I will be sending, uh, draft of a letter to the board and then a letter to the to the county board of elections any other liaison no. dr. Dolan and I attended the um, Union County uh, School Boards Association meeting on January 9th held at the high school um, we heard um, I'll say a somewhat rambling conversation about school funding um, <laughs> school finance but uh, but one thing that I thought was a somewhat um, informative although there is no uh, real comfort in knowing and anticipating the actual school aid outcomes the uh, the individual that spoke to us uh, who is immersed in um, Trenton and legislation and uh, the different House and uh, s uh, Assembly meetings and budget preparations did seem to hold some hope that uh, state aid would have uh, some boost to it. I can't, I can't pay the, the bills on that, but um, it made me feel uh, slightly more confident moving forward. But. At least it was an insider's view about the current um, motivations and what's happening in Trenton and the fact that um, in an election year and given uh, different budget situations that that might in fact uh, come to be. So. I do have liaison reports. I, I didn't write it really. Um, I went to the Roosevelt PTSO and um, they talked about their annual fundraising and the mini grants that they provide for teachers in Roosevelt and then Mr. Carey took us to a new fitness center in Roosevelt that the teachers have spearheaded. They have cleaned out a storage room and painted and are using some of the equipment from the high school um, to that, that was replaced with new equipment um, and it will be used within the fitness units that um, occur each semester or each quarter and also will be open with supervision for students in the morning and the afternoon. Um, and then I also attended the PTC special ed committee meeting um, last Wednesday where um, Hillary Freeman, a lawyer, a special ed lawyer and advocate spoke about um, IEPs and measurable goals and 
actually spent some time at the end of the night meeting with individual parents for 10 minute sort of consultations. So it was very well attended and very, I think, informative for many of the parents. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. With that, I would again recognize the public for questions and or comments on any topic. <coughs> Seeing no one come to the podium, I'd ask the board to approve the following resolutions. Resolved that the Board of Education move into private session for the purpose of discussing matters rendered confidential by state and federal law, personnel pending or anticipated litigation and pending or anticipated contract negotiations, and be it further resolved that any discussions held by the board, which need not remain confidential, and the results of the discussion will be made public as soon as practicable. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstain. We are adjourned until we return to public session later this evening. We are returning to public session. Or not? No. Uh, and I should. No, I don't. I don't think we'll get there. I don't think we will be. No. <laughs> so we have an executive session, and that is it for the evening. Thank okay. you.